a river as big as the sea, how it was once referred to by indigenous people living on its shores. In their language, it was known as Paraná, South America's second longest river, a colossus over 3,000 kilometers long. From its origin in the north of Brazil's Sao Paulo state, across the vast plains of Paraguay and northern Argentina, down to the Paraná Delta above Argentina's capital, Buenos Aires. It's part of South America we know little about. The Paraná region is an expansive natural paradise. In parts, its landscape is wholly unspoiled and entirely authentic spanning an area of almost three million square kilometers. But the Paraná is also a symbol of globalization, a host of different representatives ranging from international corporations to local farmers can all be found along this enormous river. In many places, the river's appearance has changed, often at the expense of the environment. Today, nature fights to survive, along the banks of the Paraná. But there are people living here dedicated to its survival. Their goal is to protect the river. They all share a passion for the Paraná. Paraná's origin is located between the three Brazilian states, Sao Paulo, Mato Grosso do Sul, and Minas Gerais. This is where two rivers meet. On the left is the Rio Grande, and to the right is the Paranaíba. And this is the point where the Paraná begins. For fishermen and women like us, it's our own little paradise. We are happiest on the water, close to nature, and at one with the universe. It gives us a sense of peacefulness and gratitude. In Brazil, the Paraná is a world away from the bustling cities lining the country's coast. Fishermen used to row across it. But much has changed at the river's origin over the last few decades. Brazil needed electricity. The construction of a number of hydropower plants transformed this part of the Paraná into a huge reservoir. The president of Santa Fe do Sul's Fishermen's Association grew up along the banks of the Paraná. Yoko Areta's parents came here from Japan. They too made a living from fishing. But the river has seen some dramatic changes since then. There used to be an ample supply of fish native to these waters. But when they built the hydropower plants, they didn't consider that fish need to swim upstream to spawn. Unfortunately, the hydropower plants have not met their pledge to repopulate the river with native fish. Consequently, this region is now dominated by fish farming. The river that once flowed here with all its diversity is no more. Most of the breeding tanks are used for tilapia, a fish with African heritage rather than Brazilian. And business is booming. Tilapia farmed in tropical countries is hugely popular on menus, especially in North America.
Yoko and most of her colleagues have been forced to abandon traditional fishing. Many of them now work in fish farming. The fish farms in Paraná are home to a number of species of tilapia, including Thai and African varieties. These are genetically modified subspecies that have been bred to have more meat and less skin and bones. At the edge of the breeding tanks, anglers try their luck. The food fed to the farm tilapias also attracts other fish. Fly fishers come to catch dazzling peacock bass, a type of cichlids from the Amazon thousands of kilometers away. They were introduced to the region and, following the impact of climate change, now thrive in these waters. The frosty winters seen here a few decades ago are also no more. Once a former fishing paradise, the Paraná's origin now looks very different. Surrounded by breeding tanks, the many small tributaries are the only reminder of a time gone by. Nowadays, a lot has changed, and Yoko accepts that. But what she won't accept is the thoughtless pollution of the Paraná. Raw sewage from the nearby town flows into one of the Paraná's tributaries. It's disgusting. Sewage is literally being channeled into our Paraná River. It makes me so sad. Yoko has given considerable thought to how waste from fish farming can be used productively. The skin of the fish has no real market value. I've been researching what to do with fish waste for five years now. I used the internet, books and magazines to learn more about leather. And I thought, why not use the fish skin that is thrown away or used for feeding to make a product like leather instead? Yoko now designs a range of products from fish waste. Once any fat and meat has been removed from the skin, she dyes it. Plant-based tanning agents give it the appearance of leather. The result? Some striking fashion accessories. Our shoemaker has already designed a footwear collection. The bags are sold in stores and online, mainly online, and usually to buyers outside Brazil. Some 300 kilometers further south, the Paraná still resembles a huge lake. At the small town of Presidente Epitacio, the river spans up to 10 kilometers. The Paraná is a welcome refreshment, especially during the region's long, humid summers. Its sandy shores have helped transform the sleepy town into a popular beach resort. But sandcastles and sunbathing on the banks of a river that has raw sewage pouring into it? The water here is really wonderful, very clean. You can see fish at the bottom. 
A nossa água aqui é bastante. And if you're thirsty, you can drink the water. It really is very clean. Lorival de Oliveira, known locally as Santo or Saint, runs a beach bar in Presidente Epitacio. And bizarrely, the water of the Paraná really is clear and clean. This peculiar phenomenon is due to human intervention in the ecosystem. Dams upriver have artificially increased the river's size and improved its self-cleaning abilities. Tourists don't just come to cool off. There's one other rather special attraction. We have Brazil's most beautiful sunset. There was a competition and towns and the best beaches everywhere entered. But Presidente Epitacio won the title for the most beautiful sunset. And not without reason. At the very heart of Brazil, a world away from the celebrated beaches of the Atlantic, the Paraná offers a breathtaking spectacle. It's early in the morning in the Morro do Diabo State Park. Very early. But biologist Gabriela Cabral and her team have no time to waste. The dense jungle is home to a type of monkey they are working to protect. The black lion tamarind is an endangered species, and we want to prevent it from becoming extinct. To do our work, we need to find out more about them. And that's why we're in this forest so early. We set off at 4.30 in the morning, sometimes earlier, depending how far we have to travel. We need to get there before the tamarinds leave the tree hollows where they spend the night. We've put collars on the animals that transmit FM signals. And this device picks up the signals. That's how we locate them. Turn it on. When we hear this noise, we know that they're about to leave their hollows. Quick, go to the tree, go to the tree. Okay. Only around 1,000 of these marmosets remain. All live in the state park close to the Paraná. Their diet consists of stick insects and other insects, small animals, bird eggs and forest fruits. They live in groups and sleep in hollow tree trunks. Their natural habitat is fundamental to the survival of this endangered species. Only 30 kilometers from the Paraná, the Morro do Diabo State Park provides the protective hollows they need. But it's not enough to sustain their tiny population. Most of the forest around here has been cleared to make way for farming. Areas close to the state park are now being reforested to protect endangered species like the black line tamarins, but it will take years. These reforested areas of woodland need to mature before they can provide hollows for the monkeys to sleep in. Without them, they won't make the move. So we're making artificial hollows from wooden boxes to protect them from predators. This way we hope the tamarinds will start to populate these new areas of forest. Gabriela checks the hanging boxes and examines the footage the surveillance cameras have captured. The researchers can see if the monkeys feel safe in their artificial hollows. Oh, 
quando a gente está no mato acompanhando when we're in the forest with the animals sometimes they look straight into my eyes it's like a plea for help as though they want us to help save them it's really moving toca bem no coração assim To the south of Morro do Diabo is the Brazilian state Paraná. It's named after the river that forms its western border. The state capital Curitiba is deemed to be Brazil's model green city, a model for sustainable, ecological urban development. Over the last few decades, the population has increased tenfold and is now close to two million. When Curitiba was teetering on the brink of chaos in the 1970s, Town planners developed a pioneering public transport concept which has been replicated the world over. They built large buses with barrier-free access and gave them dedicated bus lanes. The goal? To transport as many people as possible in the most effective and eco-friendly way. Over 80% of the population here uses public transport. Although nothing special today, back in the 1970s, the idea was visionary. The man behind the concept is former mayor, Jaime Lerner. Even today, the 82-year-old runs an architectural firm. Linking both reality and fantasy, it was very important for, for my profession. I think it's not just the care of limpieza, it's the care of everything. So and we start to understand that everything is important. In poorer quarters, people were rewarded with material assets for cleaning up. The rubbish disappeared from the streets. At the same time, the city was made greener. A former dumping ground is now a botanical garden. There's 50 square meters of green space for every individual. It's more than in any other major metropolis in South America. The Opera de Arame, commissioned by Lerna, feels organic in the surrounding wetlands. As far back as the 1970s, the city's mayor proved that ecological town planning in Brazil is feasible. It's a reference for many cities in the world. And I'm very proud of it. Curitiba is not only greener than other cities. As environmental protection requires a collective effort, education is widely available to everyone. The city organizes eco-seminars at an open-air conference center known as the Free University. The motto? You're all part of the Paraná state and the river it's named after. The river Paraná is not only our history, it's, it's, the, it's the sense of belonging of everyone that was born in this state. We have to take care of this river. The small town of Rolandia is located between Curitiba and the Paraná. Just outside the town is a farm, densely covered in all kinds of trees. It's Bimini, the estate belonging to family Steidler. As a Jewish family, 
the Steidlers were forced to flee the Nazis. They made their way halfway across the globe to Brazil. Here they discovered coffee cultivation, which was responsible for much of the wealth in the region. However, part of growing coffee involved clearing the jungle to create new plantations. Deforestation and land reclamation began in the 1930s when the Steidlers first came to Brazil. The jungle seemed strange and threatening to the new arrivals. Letters sent back home by Daniel Steidler's grandfather provide an insight to what life was like. Valuable documents from a very different time. Roland, 26 June 1936. There's not much I can say about the animals in the forest. I see them but I can't identify them yet. Apart from the parrots, unusually vile beasts that resemble a bizarre cross between a sparrow and a rooster. They are everywhere, screeching loudly and behaving in a highly uncouth manner. Once they appear, all the other animals retreat. Daniel no longer lives off coffee farming. Bimini's outlook on nature has changed significantly since then. Daniel is a devoted conservationist, dedicated to passing his expertise on to the next generation. Schools from the local town regularly visit this respected estate. This isn't a theory lesson. I want you to try things out. The sound engineer has a microphone and can record it. What's that noise? An alarm clock? It's a rattlesnake, guys, but don't worry. It can sense our warmth and smell us before we even knew it was there. It's already trying to get away. We like to talk about hummingbirds or how pretty the butterflies are, but nobody likes snakes. It's time for that to change. Who wants to take their shoes off before they go into the forest? Go on, feel the leaves on the forest floor. It's not just about hearing the forest, it's about feeling it too. Look at the world at our latitude. Africa is a desert, Australia is a desert. We have the Amazon River, so we're not. But the Amazon has stopped sending rain. There could be a drought here and the Paraná will dry up. That's why we need to plant more trees. Today, Bimini is home to a large arboretum that covers hectares of land. It's a test station with 80 types of indigenous Brazilian trees. The station is designed to show that reforestation is possible and key to maintaining an ecological equilibrium in the region. Forests like this are unusual here. There's monoculture farming as far as the eye can see. This is full of soya beans, which leads to disease and pest infestation. The machines they use make the ground very hard so it can't soak up the rainwater. Inside the forest is where rainwater can penetrate the ground. Farmers here all walk around with some multinational propaganda scrawled across their caps. Paraná is one of the biggest producers of soya, grains and corn. Global policies are driving us towards growing monocultures. The earth is becoming denser, everything is hard. Erosion is increasing and the soil is devoid of nutrients. 
Our ecosystem needs trees, especially because foliage on the forest floor allows the ground to soak up rainwater. The forest is our enemy and needs to be forced back. That's what the first settlers and coffee growers thought. And even today, some farmers still believe that. But not at Bimini. The trees once felled by a grandfather are now being replanted by his grandson. Initially, I thought it was madness, it would never work, but now it's a reality. It's 200 kilometers from Erlanger back to the Paraná. Close to the village of Puerto Rico, the river looks very different to the dams further north. The kilometer-wide river has become much narrower with sand-fringed archipelagos at its center. For over 20 years, this area has been a nature reserve. Eric Caldas and his team are in charge of conservation. They work for the Chico Mendes Institute for Biodiversity Conservation and report to Brazil's Ministry of the Environment. This area is a hotspot, as it's home to lots of different species. This is where the Atlantic forest in the south meets the wetlands in the north. It's a mixed ecosystem, characterized by the river and the marshlands around here. A very special nature site that needs to be protected because it's a unique intersection of both regions. The Paraná isn't dammed here making it the only section in Brazil where the river can flow freely. Eric and his team monitor the area daily. They are especially interested in the Paraná Islands, where eco-tourists can enjoy Brazil's unspoiled nature. However, there's no guarantee it will remain this idyllic. Our main concern is that they decide to build a hydropower plant here one day. We've seen it happen in other parts of Brazil, where a region's conservation status has been revoked to generate electricity. That would definitely be the biggest threat because this whole area would be wiped out. There are other daily challenges like hunting, uncontrolled construction and the negative impact of existing hydropower plants. Long term, all of these could dramatically reduce biodiversity here. Instead of hydropower, the team are hoping tourism will boost the economy in the more remote regions around Puerto Rico. If scaled up, however, conservationists believe this would also be a cause for concern. It's a fine line. One high rise dominates the town when viewed from the river. It's empty, unfinished a symbol of failed property speculation. But there's more. Luxury apartments with river views are being built on the edge of town. Oversized holiday homes in swanky complexes patrolled by private security guards, all on the banks of the Paraná. Initially, they wanted to build up to 10 high-rises, but that never happened, firstly because the economy contracted and secondly, because we intervened. Anyone wanting to stay on these archipelagos does not want to see blocks of flats on the horizon. They've left their own towns and cities to escape that kind of thing. But investors don't consider the impact. All they think of is carving up the land and building, building, building. And when they run out of space, they build higher. You can still see the river from the very top, right? But, from this perspective, it just looks like any other city. In 
Puerto Rico, the river has barely changed. It attracts visitors from the region who mingle with local fishermen at the jetty when the sun sets. It's carnival season in Brazil. But unlike Rio de Janeiro or Sao Paulo, there's no procession here. It's for herding cattle. <laughs> Bands used to perform live, but nowadays, anyone in the mood for a party needs to organize it themselves. The cash-strapped city can't afford to pay for live music. Instead, revelers meet at the promenade with powerful sound systems in their cars. take time before money from Puerto Rico's emerging tourism industry filters down. Some 50 kilometers south of Puerto Rico, in the municipality of Carencia do Norte, the people of the Paraná still depend on agriculture. Around 80% of the land belongs to just 10% of Brazil's population. It leads to social inequality and conflict. When the agricultural industry was modernized in the 1980s, many farm workers lost their jobs. As a response to their subsequent impoverishment, some began to claim land as their own, like Delfino Becker. We came here in 1988 and lived in tents for eight years. That was tough. There was a lot we didn't have. Food, the attention of the government, pretty much everyone was against us. It was a struggle. But we've owned the land here since 1995. Delfino became a member of Brazil's landless workers' movement, known as MST in Portuguese. It has an estimated membership of 1.5 million across the country. His farm hosts meetings for the movement's activists and sympathizers. For many, the fight is not over. Unfortunately, you have to fight in Brazil. My neighbor lost his brother. He was murdered in his own house. The battle for land is a bloody one. The worst part is seeing people losing their loved ones. But I think the fight is justified. I'd rather die fighting than just sitting around waiting for something to change. Although the landless workers' movement began as an illegal protest, MST now assumes the role of a cooperative and has become a major producer and exporter of rice. According to its own figures, the cooperative produces a quarter of a million sacks of rice annually. Rice is often grown in Paraná's fields, usually using traditional methods. But Delfino has gone one step further. He has started to grow organic rice. Genetically modified seeds and chemical pesticides are often used for conventional farming. 
Delfino only uses natural seeds and fertilizes his rice with manure or compost. Everything is organic. This is whole grain rice, black rice. It's easy to sell and is a healthy choice. Black rice was once banned in China. Only the emperor was allowed to eat it. You can Google it. Just search for forbidden rice or black rice. Conventional agriculture is a huge mistake because we're so close to the river. The proximity means that agroecology should take priority. Farming organic rice is interesting because the surplus water flows back into the river. And if it's an organic crop, it's healthy water going back into the river. Initially, people laughed and regarded Delfino's idea with skepticism. But now his organic rice is a familiar brand across the region. Delfino's goal is to sell his eco-friendly product beyond Paraná's state borders. Organic produce costs around 30% more in Brazil, but remains highly popular despite the country's strained economy. I feel young at heart because I see that the battle for agricultural reform needs to be relaunched. Our workers' rights are diminishing with the new government's threats. That's why we need to throw ourselves so wholeheartedly into agroecology. The Paraná winds its way from Carencia do Norte to Altonia and then onto Brazil's border town, Guajira. Lagoa Chambre, Brazil's second largest freshwater lake, is only a few kilometers from the Paraná. Tucked away behind the lake is a coffee farm, a rare sight after most of the local farmers switched to growing the more lucrative soya. It's a lovely culture and a lovely plant. When it blossoms, it's beautiful. Everyone stops to take a photo. And when it's ripe, it's bright red. The color red surrounded by all this green is beautiful too. And it smells good. Naturally, we all enjoy drinking coffee. Coffee symbolizes coming together. The gauchos drink mate or other things, the Germans drink draft beer, and we love our coffee. Coming together, having a chat over a cup of coffee, it's wonderful. Guinea Bog Farias and her husband Fernando have been married for around 30 years. And they've been running their coffee farm for almost as long. It was a dream come true for the couple. The old machines still have life in them and make some impressive noises. Tourists are welcome here too, and if visitors listen closely, they might just detect a trace of melancholy when the couple reminisce about the past and the wild Sete Quedas waterfalls back home. They disappeared in the early 1980s, when the giant dam Itaipu was built some 200 kilometers downstream. Today, this gargantuan hydropower plant, the second largest in the world, supplies enough electricity to cover three quarters of Paraguay's total consumption. 
Its construction and opening had grave consequences for the environment. Whole swathes of countryside were flooded and disappeared beneath the water. The course of the Paraná was changed, and the Sete Quedas waterfalls were lost forever, drowned by the newly formed reservoir. As quedas elas eram eram bem altas, sim. As pontes elas, inclusive, elas se mexiam porque the waterfalls were incredibly high, and the bridges across them moved because they were made from steel cables and rope. We had to walk in single file from one waterfall to the next because the bridges were so narrow. It was exciting. The waterfalls were cool and refreshing. And it was where I learned to drink beer. <laughs> it's funny what you remember. A stone's throw from the box farm is the border to Paraguay, where the second part of our journey along the Paraná continues. The river is home to Paraguay's indigenous people, the Guarani. Again, the Paraná turns into a reservoir. Threatened jungle areas are guarded by rangers. Our journey continues to Itaipu, the mega power station that has changed the Paraná so dramatically. Local people attempt to revive traditional farming along the banks of the river. And the Iguazu tributary offers a spectacular sight. At the border triangle between Brazil, Argentina and Paraguay where incredible things are made using waste products. The Paraná finally returns to its primordial state. Two thousand kilometers lie before its final destination in the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs>